10 Facts About the Seal of God That Many Do Not Know Number 1. The Meaning of the Seal of God Many are familiar with the seal of the beast and its number, but few people realize that there is a seal of God. What is this seal? And what does it mean for you and me? Seals are a type of identifying mark that is typically affixed to documents such as letters, contracts, and other writings. It showed that what was in the letter came from the person whose seal was on the outside. It was common practice in ancient times to affix a seal to cattle in order to identify the proprietor of the animal. People would be dissuaded from stealing them if they were marked with a seal because it would be visible on them. There are a few various ways in which this term is used in the Bible and when taken into consideration collectively, they assist in creating a complete picture. According to the Old Testament, God affixed a sign to his chosen people. Additionally, we see that the guards placed a great stone over the tomb of Jesus in order to seal it. And we also see that John was instructed to do the same with the words of the prophecy. This communicates security. We also read of God authenticating the relationship with his seal. This is comparable to the idea that Abraham's circumcision served as a sign and a seal of his righteousness. John chapter 6 verse 27 Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. Romans chapter 4 verse 11 And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. When we take all of this into consideration, we can see that a seal in the Bible conveys ownership, protection, and certification of the relationship between the parties involved. Number 2. It appears during the tribulation period. The mark of God shows up during the tribulation. The seal of God is like a special sign from God. It shows that God is protecting certain people, that they belong to Him, and that they are genuine followers of His. The tribulation is a future seven-year period when God will finalize His judgment of the unbelieving world. Throughout the Word of God, the tribulation is associated with the day of the Lord, which refers to the period of time when God will directly intervene in the course of history to bring about the fulfillment of His plan. That day will be a day of wrath. It will be a day of agony and anguish. It will be a day of trouble and devastation. It will be a day of darkness and gloom. It will be a day of clouds and darkness. It will be a day of trumpet and battle cry. The tribulation period will be characterized by a variety of divine judgments, turmoil in the heavenly sphere, natural calamities, and horrific plagues. Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27 gives the reason and time of the tribulation. This passage speaks of 70 weeks that have been declared against your people. Number 3. The seal of God will not be a physical mark. It's important to know that this seal isn't a physical mark. It's more like a spiritual badge. It's a way to show who is really connected to God and who is under His protection. The concept of sealing and revelation ties back to the ancient practice, but elevates it to a spiritual level. It's not just about authority and authenticity. It's about belonging to God and being identified as His own in trials and tribulations. This spiritual seal 
serves as a powerful metaphor for faith and divine safeguarding in a world of chaos and uncertainty. Number 4. The Four Angels at the River Euphrates The Four Angels at the River Euphrates talks about a significant event from the Bible in the book of Revelation. It's about a particular message found in Revelation chapter 9 verses 14 through 15. This message tells us about four evil angels who are tied up at the river Euphrates. These angels are set free to carry out an essential task from God, to bring His judgment to the world. This event takes place at the Euphrates River. The Euphrates River is a significant river mentioned in the Bible. It's known as a place where early human civilization started and has always been seen as a symbol of life and limits. When Euphrates is talked about in the book of Revelation, it takes on a new meaning. It becomes a key symbol in the events that the Bible predicts will happen in the future. Consider the words from Revelation chapter 9 verses 14 through 15 saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released, so that they would kill a third of mankind. This part of the Bible is both fascinating and a bit scary. It shows a time when God steps in and the ordinary world we know meets the spiritual world in a big way, leading to severe effects for all people. The purpose of releasing these angels is to bring about great destruction, as they are permitted to kill a third of mankind. But the question is, why would God allow the killing of one third of mankind? There is no necessary relationship between these four angels and the four angels that are mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 verse 1. They could be the same four angels, but it's also possible that they're not. Whoever they are, they are prepared for the hour, day, month, and year of the unleashing of this judgment. We read, We're released. This assumes these are bad angels. While this might not be the case, it is likely that they are evil angels. In spite of everything, they are instruments of divine purpose. The demonic locusts that were detailed earlier in Revelation were only capable of wreaking havoc on human beings. However, these four angels have the power to execute a massacre on an unprecedented scale. These angels are only awakened when God deems it to be the appropriate time to do so, and their area of action is limited to a specific portion of humanity. They carry out the will of God at the appointed time. The Euphrates River was a prominent geographical feature in ancient Babylon. It served as the edge of the ancient Roman Empire. Additionally, the Euphrates is linked to the first sin Genesis chapter 2 verses 10 through 14, the first murder, Genesis chapter 4 verse 16, the first organized rebellion against God, Genesis chapter 11 verses 1 through 9, the first war confederation, Genesis chapter 14 verse 1, and the first tyranny. These events can be found in the book of Genesis. This will be a period where divine protection will be severely needed. There will be a lot of voracious enemies, with a number too great. Revelation chapter 9 verses 16 through 19. The number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them, and this is how I saw in my vision the horses and those who sat on them. The riders had breastplates the color of fire, of hyacinth, and of brimstone, and the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire, 
the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. We read, The number of the army of the horsemen was two hundred million. Is this number figurative or literal in nature? It is possible that the number is not to be taken literally, but rather that it simply suggests an army that is impossible to count and is greater than anything that mankind has ever seen. These horsemen are described in weird, grotesque terms. This is an extremely potent image of terror, destruction, and the connotation of demons. We read, the army of the horsemen. Does this speak of an army that is normal or one that is supernatural? Is this a legion of human soldiers or an army of demonic hordes? If what is being described is a natural army of men, then the strange description may be referring to modern mechanized warfare. It's possible that John just uses the words at his disposal to depict modern machinery, which is why the story he gives is so bizarre and horrifying. Perhaps the safest interpretation is to see this as a literal 200 million strong army, but a demonic army invading Earth. This further develops the concept of the demonic army that resembles locusts, which was introduced earlier in the Revelation. The connection to demons comes from the interpretation that these angels could be fallen angels or demonic beings due to their destructive mission. Demons are shown as evil spirits. They are usually linked with the worship of false gods and idols. In the New Testament, it's clear that demons know who Jesus is and are afraid of him. They are described in the Bible as evil and rebellious spirits who are against God and people. Their role is part of the end of the world events and prophecies described in the book of Revelation. The four angels at the river Euphrates are part of an apocalyptic prophecy in Revelation, and their connection to demons is more interpretive than explicit. Their depiction as malicious spiritual beings is consistent throughout the biblical narrative. During this dark period, we see the seal of God as judgment is held back until the servants of God are sealed. Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 through 3 After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea, or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, holding the seal of the living God. And he called out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, or the sea, or the trees, until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. The phrase four corners of the earth is an ancient and sometimes modern equivalent to the idea of the four points of the compass. The concept here is that these angels have an effect on the whole planet. We read, Holding the four winds of the earth. These winds were a destructive force of God's judgment, as winds are frequently depicted as being in the Old Testament. Another angel who also possessed a seal, was the one who put it on the people of God. These kinds of seals were commonplace in the ancient world. These servants of God will obtain a shielding seal on their forehead, containing God's name in some manner. Number 5. The 144,000 are sealed. The 144,000 sealed servants. The 144,000 sealed servants is a mix of mystery, symbols, and promises about the end times. This talks about 144,000 of God's servants 
being specially chosen and marked for protection. These servants come from the 12 tribes of Israel. The act of sealing, as described in Revelation, signifies a divine mark of protection and ownership. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, it says, And I heard how many were sealed, 144,000, 12,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. This sealing process is not just a literal marking, but symbolizes spiritual preservation during times of tribulation. Each of the 12 tribes of Israel contributes 12,000 members, signifying completeness and perfection in God's selection. The number 144,000 is rich in symbolism. In biblical numerology, 12 often represents divine authority and completeness. Multiplying 12 tribes by 12,000 members from each tribe suggests a magnified completeness. Additionally, the total 144,000 is seen by some as symbolic rather than literal, representing the totality of God's people, both Jews and Gentiles, marked as faithful servants. The sealing of the 144,000 is a sign of God's sovereignty and His ability to preserve His chosen ones in the midst of chaos and destruction. This notion offers comfort to believers, assuring them of God's protection and the importance of faithfulness. Also, choosing 144,000 people from the 12 tribes shows God bringing His people back together. It reminds us that God keeps a close relationship with Israel. In conclusion, the narrative of the 144,000 sealed servants is an indication of hope, assurance, and divine promise. It's not just about a select group from history, but a timeless symbol of God's protection and the ultimate triumph of good over evil. We are not informed what precisely their service is, but the 144,000 are sealed for a distinctive and special purpose. However, the concept of being sealed as a whole isn't restricted to them in any way. Number six, we are also sealed with the Spirit of God. But what is the seal in Ephesians chapter one? The seal is not a what, but a who. Take another look at verse 13. Ephesians chapter one, verses 13 through 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the good news of your salvation, and as a result believed in him, were stamped with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, the one promised by Christ, as owned and protected by God. The Spirit is the guarantee, the first installment, the pledge, a foretaste of our inheritance, until the redemption of God's own purchased possession, his believers, to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is the seal that identifies a Christian. His people are bound by him. When a person believes in God, the Holy Spirit of God comes to dwell or take up residence in them. In addition, I believe that the nuances discussed earlier are applicable here. The promised Holy Spirit identifies God's people as his inheritance. And the experience of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life is proof to them and a demonstration to others of the genuineness of their faith. The Holy Spirit provides the inward assurance that they belong to God as children. Galatians chapter four, verse six. And because you really are his sons, God has sent the spirit of a son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Romans chapter eight, verses 15 through 16. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading again to fear of God's judgment, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, the spirit producing sonship, 
by which we joyfully cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies and confirms together with our spirit, assuring us that we believers are children of God. Some other verses where we see this concept developed in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. It is he who has also put his seal on us. That is, he has appropriated us and certified us as his, and has given us the Holy Spirit in our hearts as a pledge, like a security deposit to guarantee the fulfillment of his promise of eternal life. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but seek to please him, by whom you were sealed and marked, branded as God's own, for the day of redemption, the final deliverance from the consequences of sin. To be sealed with the Holy Spirit is God's gracious gift, whereby he demonstrates the authenticity of the believer's relationship with him and his authority, ownership, and commitment to his people. The sealing of the Holy Spirit provides comfort and challenge to believers, affirming their belonging to him. It is a challenge to us to turn away from everything that is wicked and to identify ourselves with the one to whom we belong. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God, which he has laid, stands sure and unshaken, despite attacks, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord stand apart from wickedness and withdraw from wrongdoing. Jesus was given a seal, and the Father in heaven affixed his own seal to Jesus. John chapter 6 verse 27 Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father, God, has set a seal. We have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote, God has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21-22 through 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Number 8. The Mark of the Beast versus the Mark of God the seal of God and the mark of the beast from the book of Revelation show a difference between good and evil and between God's power and the power of the world. The Seal of God The seal of God mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 verses 2 through 3 represents divine protection and ownership. It's given to God's faithful followers marking them as his own in a spiritual sense. Unlike a physical mark, it symbolizes a deep personal commitment to God and his teachings. Possessing this seal of God indicates spiritual safeguarding during times of trial and judgment. It's a sign of being chosen by God, reflecting a life lived in accordance with the divine principles. The Mark of the Beast the mark of the beast talked about in Revelation chapter 13 verses 16 through 17 is a sign that shows loyalty to the beast, a bad character against God. It means turning away from God and choosing to follow the power of people in the world, which is often not right or good. According to the Bible passages in Revelation chapter 16 verse 2 and 19 verse 20, the mark of the beast is a symbol that distinguishes those who worship the beast. Revelation chapter 13 verses 16 through 17. Also, he compels all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, signifying allegiance to the beast 
and that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. He causes all to receive a mark. A mark will be given to everyone under the government of the beast and his associate. This mark is necessary to participate in the economy, and those without it will not be able to buy or sell anything. Only those bearing a special number on a visible part of their body, hand or forehead, will be allowed to trade, and the number will only be marked on those who engage in imperial idolatry. The number 666 is the coded name of the dictator. We have already discussed its meaning, the nature of apocalyptic writing. Until he arrives, when his identity with this figure will be only too obvious, all attempts to decode it are useless speculation. One thing is clear. He will fall short of perfection. Seven, in every regard. A mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Satan is not a creative being. All he can do is imitate God. We are not surprised to find that this too is a satanic parody of something God will do. It imitates God's mark upon his people. The seal of God represents divine authority and protection, while the mark of the beast signifies submission to worldly corrupt power. The seal of God is a spiritual mark denoting faith and obedience to God, whereas the mark of the beast is often interpreted as a physical or visible sign of compliance with evil forces. The seal of God signifies eternal salvation and alignment with God's will, while the mark represents temporal gain at the cost of spiritual condemnation. Number 9. The fate of those that have the mark of God and those that have the mark of the beast. What happens to those who take the mark of the beast? Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 through 11. Then another angel, a third one followed them saying with a loud voice, Whoever worships the beast and his image and receives the mark of the beast on his forehead or on his hand, he too will have to drink of the wine of the wrath of God, mixed undiluted into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone, flaming sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, Christ. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. We read, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand. As a result of this, we are reminded that there is a relationship between worshipping the beast and his image and obtaining the mark on his forehead or on his hand. The mark will not be taken carelessly or by accident. There will be sufficient clarity regarding the connection between worshipping the beast and taking the mark. Although receiving the mark may seem innocent enough to those who dwell on the earth, it is possible that in their minds it may not appear to be much more than a simple promise of allegiance and dedication to the Antichrist and his administration. At the same time, during the first few centuries of Christianity, making a pledge that Caesar is Lord was considered by the ancient pagans to be a harmless exercise of civic obligation. We read, He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. Those who worship the Antichrist will be compelled to consume the wine that is the result of God's intense wrath. This cup of God's wrath is comparable to wine that has not been diluted and has been seasoned with spices to make it even more potent, full strength. God is clearly not happy with those who take the mark. Number 10. 
The Mark in Ezekiel In Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4, a similar protective seal was given to the righteous before Jerusalem was judged. In this chapter, six executions are seen coming from the north, the direction from which the Babylonians were to come, to destroy idolaters. Those who opposed the idolatry were sealed by a mark on their foreheads, so that they would not be slain. Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4 And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and make a mark on the foreheads of the people who groan and sigh over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst. In conclusion, the seal of God, particularly in the context of the book of Revelation, holds great significance, inviting deeper study and reflection. The seal of God in Revelation shows God's steady promise to protect us in hard times and reminds us of who we are as followers of Christ. In closing, our question for the day. What's a worship song that has helped you feel closer to God?